When you're part of the Chicago outfit, brutality isn't just expected, it's demanded. The men we're about to uncover didn't just climb the ranks, they carved their way through with blood-soaked hands and merciless precision. From cold-blooded executions to schemes that left bodies scattered across the streets, these mobsters embodied fear itself. Let's take a dark plunge into the lives of the five most ruthless mobsters of the outfit, starting with Marco D'Amico, a cunning capo who knew how to play the game, until those who crossed him paid the price in flesh and bone. Marco, the mover D'Amico, might have been born into a quiet, unassuming world on January 1st, 1936, but the streets of Chicago had plans for him that would be anything but ordinary. Raised in a city thick with organized crime, he learned early that survival wasn't just about street smarts, it was about knowing when to make the right moves and when to bite. D'Amico was never the flashiest gangster, nor the loudest, but his rise through the ranks of the Chicago outfit would prove his cunning was deadly enough to secure him a seat among the most dangerous men in the Midwest. This is the story of how a man known for his cool exterior and meticulous planning became the quiet consigliere of one of America's most feared crime organizations, and how his calculated moves at times led to bloody consequences. D'Amico's early days in the outfit began not with violence, but with cards and dice. In the 1950s and 60s, his reputation grew as a capable sports gambler and bookmaker. His first arrest in 1958 for gambling barely caused a ripple, and by the time he was picked up again in 1968, he'd learned how to slither through the cracks of the law. Each charge brought against him slid off like rain on a windshield, barely touching the core of his operations. But he wasn't just playing games with cards. D'Amico was playing chess with lives. By the 1970s, D'Amico had carved out his own piece of Chicago's gambling underworld. His operations ran smoothly and he was never far from an illicit poker game or sports bet. Sometimes rubbing elbows with the very cops meant to arrest him. The rush of the game wasn't enough though. As his gambling empire grew, so did his appetite for power. In 1976, a minor scrape at an illegal card game showed he was willing to defend his turf with more than a bluff. And just two years later, a fight on the streets of Chicago brought out his more violent side. Yet, it was the incident in 1983 that would reveal the dark savagery lurking beneath his composed exterior. It was 1983, and D'Amico, feeling untouchable, had a few drinks too many before getting behind the wheel. When the flashing lights of a police cruiser pulled him over, something inside him snapped. The officers didn't know they were dealing with the man they called the Mover, but soon they would. The DUI stop should have been routine, but D'Amico turned it into a bloodbath, lunging at one of the officers. The chaos escalated until D'Amico latched onto the cop's hand with his teeth, biting down until he severed the officer's finger in a fit of primal rage. Though he managed to dodge serious charges, the event was a violent reminder that D'Amico wasn't just a gambler, he was a predator willing to tear apart anyone in his path. By the early 1990s, D'Amico had solidified his position within the outfit, working closely with top mobsters like John DeFronso. His expertise in sports bookmaking and poker had earned him a comfortable spot near the top. But the life of a consigliere was never without peril, and when Leonard Patrick, an old associate, turned rat, the outfit needed to send a message. D'Amico knew what had to be done. In May 1992, that message came in the form of a car bomb planted outside the home of Leonard Patrick's daughter, Sharon. It was an unmistakable warning to anyone who dared to betray the Chicago outfit. The BMW exploded in a shower of twisted metal and flames, lighting up the night in West Rogers Park. While the target survived, the statement was clear. No one was beyond the reach of the outfit, not even the family of turncoats. D'Amico, ever the strategist, managed to stay in the shadows, orchestrating violence without dirtying his own hands. But his careful manoeuvring wouldn't last forever. In 1995, the walls came crashing down. D'Amico found himself cornered, facing federal charges not just for gambling, but for racketeering, extortion and conspiracy. His grip on the outfit sports betting empire, which had operated for decades, was slipping. Robert Cooley, a former lawyer and mob associate turned informant, had set D'Amico up in a sting operation that exposed everything. His illegal poker games, the extortion of gambling debts and his plans to rob a high-stakes poker game near Lake Geneva. Caught in a web of wiretaps and informants, D'Amico had no choice but to face the music. In the courtroom, he initially tried to fight back, demanding the government prove he was a high-ranking member of the outfit. 
But when prosecutors prepared to bring in a parade of witnesses to testify against him, including former mob insiders, D'Amico finally folded. On May 1st, 1995, he pleaded guilty, acknowledging his role in the Chicago outfit and admitting to a laundry list of crimes. The man who had carefully built his empire from the shadows was now fully exposed. Though he received a sentence of over 12 years in prison, D'Amico's reign wasn't completely over. Even behind bars, his influence persisted. The outfit continued to operate, and D'Amico remained a respected figure within its ranks. He survived his prison sentence, emerging in 2005 with his power intact, even if his position in the organization had shifted. But the years had taken their toll, and D'Amico, now an aging gangster, retreated to a quieter life. He lived out his final days in relative obscurity, his violent past and once mighty empire fading into the chronicles of Chicago's underworld history. On April 22, 2020, Marco the Mover D'Amico passed away. His death marked not just the end of his life, but the end of an era for the Chicago outfit. The once dominant criminal empire had crumbled, and D'Amico's passing symbolized the final collapse of the old guard. The man who had bitten off a cop's finger, orchestrated bombings, and ruled the outfit's gambling operations had moved his final piece on the board. Tony Accardo didn't just rule the Chicago outfit, he was the Chicago outfit. Known as Joe Batters for his brutal, hands-on approach to problem solving, Accardo's grip on power was absolute. His strategies as deadly as the violence he unleashed. From the merciless monarch seizing the throne with his sinister schemes to the feared enforcer who dealt with betrayal in the most unforgiving ways, Accardo's reign was a masterclass in domination. Get ready to plunge into the dark genius of the man who transformed Chicago's mob into a well-oiled machine of murder, money and power. Anthony Joseph Accardo, better known by the ominous monikers Joe Batters and Big Tuna, stood as a towering figure in the annals of American organized crime. Born Antonino Leonardo Accardo on April 28, 1906, in the heart of Chicago's gritty near west side, his rise from street urchin to the helm of the notorious Chicago outfit was the stuff of legend. A criminal career that spanned over eight decades saw Accardo evolve from a lowly hoodlum to the day-to-day -day boss of the outfit in 1947, and eventually to the shadowy puppet master pulling the strings behind the throne by 1972. Under his cold, calculating command, the outfit expanded its influence, wealth and power, becoming a sprawling criminal empire that left no stone unturned, no law unbroken. Accardo's early years were the prelude to the dark symphony of his life. Born to Sicilian immigrants from Castelvetrano, the second of six children, his future seemed carved in the rough cobblestones of Chicago's streets. By age 14, disillusioned with school and distracted by the dangerous allure of the underworld, Accardo found himself loitering around pool halls. His timing was impeccable. Chicago's criminal scene was a cauldron of chaos and gangs like the Circus Cafe Gang, run by Claude Maddox and Tony Capizio, offered a gateway to fortune, albeit at the cost of one's soul. Ruthless ambition quickly became young Accardo's hallmark. His involvement with the Circus Cafe Gang caught the attention of Jack Machine Gun McGurn, one of Al Capone's most lethal hitmen. McGurn, impressed by the boy's cunning and utter disregard for human life, ushered him into Capone's inner circle. It wasn't long before Ocado earned his chilling sobriquet, Joe Batters. The legend goes that during Prohibition, Ocado demonstrated his savage loyalty to the outfit by beating three turncoat mobsters to death with a baseball bat. It was Capone himself who allegedly quipped, this kid's a real Joe Batters. That grotesque baptism cemented his status, and from that moment on, the blood spilled in Ocado's name flowed freely. In 1932, with Al Capone behind bars for tax evasion, a power vacuum formed within the outfit. Frank the Enforcer Nitty assumed control, but it was Accardo's ruthless efficiency in making money that secured him his own crew and a seat at the table. Prohibition had ended, but Accardo was already pivoting, moving seamlessly into new criminal ventures. His operations expanded into gambling, loan sharking, extortion and illegal alcohol and cigarette distribution. 
Every racket filled his pockets and those of the outfit with staggering profits. Ocado's dominance extended far beyond Chicago. His reach into Hollywood through union corruption made even the wealthiest film studios bend to his will. Meanwhile, his connections to Kansas and Oklahoma allowed him to smuggle bootlegged alcohol across state lines, creating a river of illicit revenue. But power came at a price. Nitty, unable to face yet another prison sentence, took his own life in 1943. The outfit needed a new leader, and Ocado, ever the opportunist, stood ready to ascend. But his rise wasn't without turbulence. Ocado's involvement in the outfit's growing grip over Hollywood unions drew the attention of federal authorities. The fallout led to long prison sentences for senior outfit members, including Paul the waiter Rika, Ocado's mentor. With Rika behind bars, Ocado assumed the mantle of acting boss, a role that placed him in the crosshairs of law enforcement. Ocado's pragmatism, however, proved as lethal as his violent tendencies. Rather than succumb to pressure, he adapted. By the late 1940s, the outfit under his control expanded into slot machines, narcotics and even counterfeit tax stamps. Chicago's underworld burgeoned and Ocado, the cool-headed mob kingpin, stood at the epicenter. In the post-war years, Ocado's vision for the outfit reached new heights. He diversified the outfit's criminal portfolio, venturing into Las Vegas where gambling had become the new gold mine. Unlike the reckless mobsters of New York who sought control through brute force, Ocado's approach was strategic and deliberate. He embedded the outfit into the legal casino operations, ensuring that their slot machines, their games and their men controlled the action. Ocado's influence stretched beyond state borders, turning Las Vegas into a cash cow for the Chicago outfit. Ocado was more than just a criminal. He was a strategist, a tactician, orchestrating crimes with a cold precision that rivaled any corporate tycoon. Yet even empires have cracks. As the 1950s dawned, the heat from law enforcement intensified. In 1957, federal agents raided Ocado's palatial mansion in River Forest, Illinois, as part of a larger investigation into organized crime. The government sought to pin tax evasion charges on Ocado, just as they had with Capone. But Ocado, always one step ahead, avoided the trap. By distancing himself from direct involvement in the outfit's more visible operations, he made it nearly impossible for authorities to tie him to any single crime. Even as his soldiers were taken down, Ocado remained untouched, a shadow looming large but invisible to those who sought him. In 1972, after Rika's death, Ocado's power within the outfit became absolute. No longer just the acting boss, he was now the undisputed puppet master. He maintained control over the outfit's vast criminal empire while keeping a low profile, a stark contrast to the flamboyant mob bosses who craved the spotlight. From the shadows, Ocado orchestrated everything, from narcotics trafficking to casino operations to labor racketeering. He even expanded into new territories, solidifying the outfit's presence across the Midwest and beyond. Under his reign, the outfit reached unprecedented levels of wealth and power. But the final fall was inevitable. The cracks in the outfit's armor began to show in the 1980s as younger, more aggressive mobsters sought to make names for themselves. The FBI's relentless pursuit of organized crime, combined with new laws like the RICO Act, meant that the outfit's days of unchecked power were coming to an end. While Ocado avoided prosecution for most of his life, his control over the outfit slowly waned. By the time of his death, on May 22, 1992, at the age of 86, the outfit had been severely weakened. Though his body was laid to rest, the legacy of blood and violence he left behind would haunt Chicago for generations. Ocado's life, a twisted ballet of power, violence and survival, left a lasting scar on America's criminal landscape. The cold eyes of Joe Batters may have closed forever, but the echoes of his brutality and the empire he built would never be forgotten. Chicago's underworld was Marcello's kingdom, and his throne was built on the bones of the fallen. James Little Jimmy Marcello didn't need to raise his voice to command. His mere presence promised a brutal end to those who crossed him. Torture, disappearances, and public executions weren't just tactics. They were his calling cards. Under Marcello's gaze, the city became a blood-soaked canvas. 
each victim a brushstroke in his masterpiece of terror. Brace yourself for the savage rise of a mob boss who made death his business, and business was booming. James J. Marcello, or Little Jimmy as he was known, wasn't just another cog in the ruthless machine of the Chicago outfit. No, Jimmy was the sort of man who didn't just rise through the ranks by pulling triggers and collecting envelopes. His climb to power, shrouded in betrayal and soaked in blood, reads more like a nightmarish fable where loyalty is fleeting and survival is nothing but a desperate game of shadows. In his early days, Marcello seemed unassuming, just another laborer working for the Department of Streets and Sanitation. But beneath the surface of that mundane existence was a man with a thirst for control, for dominance. By the time the 1980s rolled around, the whispers in the streets of Chicago had begun. Little Jimmy's rising, they'd say, as bodies started disappearing, and money flowed to Marcello in rivers of illicit cash. It was in 1983 that Marcello took his final step into the underworld's dark embrace, becoming a made man in the Chicago outfit. The act wasn't without its cost. To earn the honor, one had to spill blood. Innocence obliterated by the press of a trigger, a life reduced to a statistic. But Marcello wasn't a man to flinch. His heritage may have been tainted by Irish blood through his mother, but that didn't stop him from doing what had to be done. He crossed the line, and there was no going back. As the 1990s dawned, Marcello's influence grew even further. His relationship with the likes of Joseph Ayupa and Sam Wings Carlisi only cemented his position, but with power comes peril. On December 15, 1992, the federal authorities finally snapped their jaws around Marcello, charging him and Carlisi with racketeering. The charges painted a chilling portrait of Marcello's empire. Bookmaking, loan sharking, and street taxes bled from the terrified residents of Cook and DuPage counties. One of the more gruesome allegations? A plot to silence Anthony Dedino, a man teetering on the edge of becoming a snitch. But Dedino was fortunate enough to escape a fate Marcello usually reserved for rats. Marcello's ability to manipulate others was almost more frightening than his capacity for violence. In one instance, he orchestrated the firebombing of the Lake Theater in Oak Park, a message written in flames during a union dispute. The night sky was ablaze, the fire a testament to Marcello's iron grip on his territory. Yet despite all the violence, despite the mounting bodies and shattered lives, the law's long arm finally caught Marcello in 1995, sentencing him to 12 and a half years in prison. As he stood before the judge, his words oozed defiance. If my name wasn't James Marcello, I wouldn't be standing in front of you. His mouthpiece, the epitome of mafia arrogance, seemed to echo a promise that even prison bars couldn't hold him down for long. And they didn't. Marcello walked out of prison in November 2003, his time behind bars little more than a pit stop. He slid back into Chicago's shadows like a ghost, resuming his operations from behind the scenes. While Marcello's half-brother Michael Mickey Marcello ran the day-to-day, -day, Jimmy directed the family from a distance. His name whispered only in the darkest corners of Chicago's underworld. But fate had more than just prison time in store for Jimmy. In April 2005, the walls finally began to close in as he was indicted on murder and racketeering charges. Among the crimes pinned to Marcello's name was the savage murder of the Spilotro brothers. Anthony Tony the Ant and Michael Spilotro, who were lured into a false sense of security before being bludgeoned to death in a brutal display of Chicago justice. Their bodies, dumped like trash in an Indiana cornfield, lay undiscovered for days their once feared names reduced to a media circus. The Spilotro murders weren't the only ghosts haunting Marcello. As federal investigators peeled back the layers of his criminal enterprise, they uncovered Marcello's operation of a lucrative video gambling racket that had infiltrated countless businesses in Cicero and Berwyn. The more they dug, the more they found unions corrupted, businesses squeezed dry, and lives ended with a whispered order from Jimmy Marcello. Marcello's final rise came in 2007, as Operation Family Secrets gripped Chicago like a vice. This trial wasn't just a legal battle, it was the beginning of the end for the Chicago outfit's old guard. As mobsters lined up to testify, desperate to save themselves, 
Marcello remained silent. He watched from the shadows, knowing that his legacy, written in blood, was unraveling before his eyes. On September 10, 2007, the verdict was clear. Marcello, once the untouchable puppet master of Chicago's underworld, was convicted. The reign of terror had ended, but the bloodstains he left behind would never truly be washed away. In the world of organized crime, there's no retirement. There's no walking away. For James Marcello, every rise in power was met with an equal fall, a relentless seesaw of brutality and consequence. And when his time finally ran out, the legacy he left behind was not one of loyalty or respect, but of fear, fire, and death. Behind every ruthless boss stands a true puppeteer. And for the Chicago outfit, that man was Paul Rieker. With a mind sharper than any blade and a heart colder than the Chicago wind, Rieker ruled without fanfare, directing the city's criminal empire from the shadows. His influence was everywhere, from backroom deals to bodies in the streets, each move calculated to perfection. Buckle up as we delve into the life of Paul Rieker, the silent yet deadly ruler who turned Chicago into his own personal killing ground. Paul de Lucia, better known as Paul Rieker, was born into a world where survival often meant wielding a knife rather than words. Hailing from Naples on November 14, 1897, he quickly learned that loyalty in the criminal underworld demanded blood. Rika's first taste of the darkness that would define his life came at 17, when he was ordered by the Camorra to slit Emilio Parillo's throat. The blade carved more than just flesh. It solidified his place in a world ruled by violence. He would claim that Parillo's murder was an act of vengeance for breaking an engagement to his sister, but the truth was far more sinister. It was his initiation into the brutal world of organized crime. Rika's rise within the ranks of the Camorra was swift, but his violent actions did not go unnoticed by authorities. Convicted of Perillo's murder, he was imprisoned, but prison bars couldn't hold the fury that brewed inside him. Upon release, Rika wasted no time hunting down Vincenzo Capasso, the man who had testified against him. Rika's revenge was savage. He cornered Capasso and, with a blade gleaming in the moonlight, slashed his throat, ensuring no one ever dared betray him again. The brutality of Capasso's death sent shockwaves through Naples, forcing Rika to flee Italy, assuming a new name, Paul Maglio, and finding refuge in Cuba before slipping into the shadows of New York City in 1920. In Chicago, under the wing of the notorious bootlegger Joseph Diamond Joe Esposito, Rika's true ascent began. Smuggling whiskey and moonshine across state lines was dangerous, but it paid well and earned Rika a new nickname, The Waiter, for his polite demeanor while running Bella Napoli, Esposito's restaurant. Rika wasn't destined to remain a mere frontman for illegal liquor. He had the ambition and ruthlessness to climb further into the outfit's dark core. His opportunity came on September 20th, 1926, when rival gangsters from Chicago's north side launched a daring assault on Al Capone's headquarters. Rika, with a killer's instinct for danger, spotted the incoming gunfire and hurled himself toward Capone, pulling him out of the line of fire just as the bullets began to rain. Though Rika took a bullet in the shoulder, Capone emerged unscathed and forever indebted to Rika. This heroic act earned Rika not only Capone's favor, but the unwavering loyalty of the outfit. Yet despite his growing power, Rika's ascent wasn't without its turbulence. The attempted assassination left him marked as a target, and the constant threat of gang wars meant Rika's life could end in a hail of bullets at any moment. By 1931, Rika had maneuvered himself into the highest echelons of power. Capone may have been the public face of the Chicago outfit, but it was Rika pulling the strings. While Frank the Enforcer, Nitty, was Capone's nominal successor after Capone was convicted of tax evasion, everyone knew who really held the reins. Rika's iron grip on the syndicate became undeniable when even Lucky Luciano and Maya Lansky, the architects of the National Crime Syndicate, answered only to Rika, not Nitti. Under Rika's watch, the outfit thrived, expanding into labor racketeering, illegal gambling and extortion. Yet with every rise came the inevitable fall. In 1943, Rika's criminal empire faced its greatest threat. The Hollywood extortion scandal saw Rika and several of his men indicted for forcing movie studios to pay protection money. Despite Rika's attempts to keep his hands clean, federal authorities were closing in and Rika knew justice was about to come crashing down on him. 
The trial was brutal, the kind that drags out dark secrets into the light. Rika, for all his cunning, was sentenced to 10 years in federal prison, a devastating blow that left his empire vulnerable. But Rika wasn't just a survivor. He was a man who knew how to manipulate the system. Using his political connections and bribes, he managed to be released early, serving only three years behind bars. Yet the damage was done. While the outfit survived, Rika had lost control, and the underworld had begun to turn on itself. After his release, Rika didn't rush back to reclaim his throne. He had learned from Capone's fall. Visibility was dangerous. Instead, Rika ruled quietly from the shadows, letting frontmen like Tony Accardo take the public spotlight. But make no mistake, Rika was still the true boss. Whenever a problem arose, Rika would simply mutter, make him go away. The outfit grew even more powerful under his quiet command. Rika avoided the limelight, but his reputation as a ruthless and calculating leader only grew. However, by the 1960s, Rika's health began to fail. The once feared mob boss was now a shadow of the man who had slit his enemy's throats without hesitation. His power faded with his strength, and the outfit, while still formidable, had begun to fracture. The violence that Rika had once so expertly wielded now spiralled out of control as younger, hungrier men began to tear the organisation apart from the inside. Paul Rika, once dubbed the country's most important criminal, died on October 11th, 1972, in quiet obscurity. His reign had been long, his influence vast, but the legacy he left behind was one stained in blood, both his enemies and his own. When you're a mobster known as Joey the Clown, you might think the name brings a smile. But for Joseph Lombardo, the laughs ended when the blood started flowing. With a rap sheet thicker than most novels, Lombardo was a key figure in the Chicago outfit, pulling strings behind the scenes while dodging prison bars like a circus act. Whether it was orchestrating high-stakes heists or making enemies vanish into thin air, Lombardo proved that his jokes always ended with a punchline soaked in danger. Let's dive into the twisted life of the man who hid a killer's heart behind a clown's grin. Joey. The clown Lombardo's life wasn't a joke. It was a carefully orchestrated dance of crime, deceit and power. Born Giuseppe Lombardi on New Year's Day, 1929, he was raised in a crowded Chicago neighborhood, the child of Italian immigrants from Bari. His father, Mike Lombardi, a butcher by trade, believed in hard work, but Joey had different aspirations. By the time he dropped out of high school, he had already begun carving a path in the Chicago outfit, a notorious crime syndicate that would become his life and his legacy. In the gritty streets of 1950s Chicago, young Lombardo didn't waste time in making a name for himself. His first forays into crime were humble small-time jewel thefts and collecting juice loans for the outfit. But it was his ruthlessness that quickly caught the attention of those higher up the food chain. Lombardo had an uncanny ability to silence debtors, ensuring the outfit always got what was owed. His reputation as a relentless collector preceded him, and his criminal resume rapidly expanded. By the early 1960s, he was an up-and-comer, rising alongside Angelo the Hook La Pietra. Together, they took over various outfit operations, their influence stretching from the grimy alleys of Chicago to the glitzy casinos of Las Vegas. But with success came law enforcement scrutiny. In 1963, Lombardo was arrested for kidnapping and loan sharking. The case was as airtight as they come. A factory worker owed the outfit $2,000 and was behind on payments. Yet when it came time to testify, fear gripped the victim's throat. He couldn't positively identify Lombardo, sealing his fate with yet another acquittal, the 11th in Lombardo's string of arrests. Lombardo, with his ever-present smirk, walked free. But the pressure from the feds wasn't letting up. The noose was tightening, though he continued to dance around it. In the 1970s, Lombardo had his eyes set on bigger prizes. After taking over the outfit's operations in Las Vegas in 1971, he set up a complex skimming operation, siphoning millions from the city's most lucrative casinos. The Stardust Resort and Casino, among others, saw its profits vanish into Lombardo's coffers, fueling the outfit's power back in Chicago. But Lombardo's greed would be his downfall. 
In 1982, he was convicted of bribing Nevada Senator Howard Cannon to block a trucking deregulation bill. His smooth rise came to a crashing halt as he was sentenced to 15 years behind bars. His cell might have been small, but his empire still loomed large beyond the prison walls. Then, in 1986, the second hammer fell. Lombardo was convicted of skimming over $2 million from Las Vegas Strip casinos. The sentence tacked on another decade to his prison time. It seemed the mighty clown had been reduced to little more than a prisoner, yet prison could never fully contain a man of his cunning. After serving only 10 years, Lombardo was released in 1992, emerging from prison unscathed and unapologetic. He wasted no time reminding the world that Joey the Clown was back. In a move that was as brazen as it was theatrical, Lombardo took out a classified ad in the Chicago Tribune. It read like a mockery of both law enforcement and his enemies. I never took a secret oath with guns and daggers, pricked my finger, drew blood or burned paper to join a criminal organization. If anyone hears my name used in connection with any criminal activity, please notify the FBI, local police, and my parole officer, Ron Kumke. The ad was dripping with sarcasm, and the authorities were not amused. Lombardo's second act was about to begin. He swiftly re-established his connections, orchestrating rackets that included loan sharking, gambling, and murder. But Lombardo was no fool. He knew the FBI was watching. They had been trying to crack the outfit's wall of silence for years. And now, in 2003, a new investigation, Operation Family Secrets, threatened to expose decades of bloodshed. Lombardo's name was tied to at least one murder, but his crimes ran much deeper than that. When federal agents rounded up 14 defendants in the Family Secrets case in 2005, Lombardo did what he did best, disappeared. He became a fugitive, sending letters to his lawyer, addressed to the judge, proclaiming his innocence with almost laughable misspellings and grammatical errors. I am no part of enterprise or racketing. Have no part in the poker machines, extorsionate loans, gambling, and whatever else the indictment says. He even offered to take a lie detector test. But US District Judge James Zagel wasn't amused, denying every one of Lombardo's bizarre requests. Lombardo managed to stay hidden for over eight months. During his time on the run, he wrote cryptic letters to his lawyer, even commenting on local news stories. He was watching, lurking and waiting, but the clock was ticking. On January 13th, 2006, Lombardo's luck finally ran out. His once meticulous disguise, now a scraggly beard and an unkempt appearance, couldn't save him. FBI agents found him hiding outside the Elmwood Park home of a longtime friend, Dominic Calaco. With little resistance, Lombardo was arrested. The clown had been caught, but his legacy of crime was far from over. In 2007, Lombardo was sentenced to life in prison for his role in the family secrets case. He stood accused of multiple murders and racketeering charges that spanned decades. Among the most notorious was the brutal 1974 murder of businessman Daniel Seifert, a witness who was set to testify against Lombardo. Seifert's murder sent shockwaves through Chicago, but Lombardo showed no remorse. He was a man who lived and breathed the outfit, and his reign of terror finally ended behind bars. On October 19, 2019, Joey the Clown Lombardo died in prison at the age of 90. His death marked the end of an era, but the shadows of his crimes and the blood on his hands would linger long after he was gone.